Episode 4 Power 1 Rumbling Meanwhile, after the secret meeting with the Order, Eckhar and Kina return from Dumodoxia. They certainly had to discuss the proposal received from Helrix. At that time, it was very useful to have members of the Order as allies. Although it had fewer members, it boasted of unique warriors, starting from the infallible army. First of all the Runga and then the Correro, Rahi coming from Kurzani and endowed with their logical and rational thinking. They approved Herrick's ideologies and decided to become her guards. Their psychic powers made them virtually unbeatable since they could disable the mind of their prey or opponent, confusing it and making it vulnerable. They were created by Mutron as a personal army of Icarax, but according to the latter, they had some defects and were abandoned on Karzani. Subsequently, once they had contact with the Order and Helrix, they decided to support her cause and over the years, the army became more and more powerful, reaching the peak of its potential in the last world war. Eckhart was thus faced with a difficult decision that could seize a war more and more to the limit. It broke out just in the last few months, involving Matoran and Agori for multiple reasons. It all started with the continuous misunderstandings between the United Villages and New Daxia from various points of view, from the economic to the social and cultural one. Not only, but recently, in a single year, some goods of both people disappeared altogether, leaving no trace. Many individuals, including some Toa, began to miss mysteriously and without apparent reason. The Agori, then followed by some Glatorian, believed it was a stupid lie, and so they decided to drive out all the Matoran who lived in the individual villages. In the years to come, some refueling sites came for some reason destroyed, along with some military bases that rejected the threats of the remaining Skakti. The continuous protests overthrew Akar, who tried in vain to find a compromise, and Ranu was elected as the new leader of the United Villages. The Agori of Volcanus did not think twice and immediately contended the population declaring war. Eckhart, however, did not completely lose his position and became head of the army of Sir Tavis, in honor of the valiant Glatorian. The mere thought intrigued the veteran of the Fire Tribe. Kin and he could not understand how in such a short time the work made by Matinui was pulverized in the blink of an eye and how simple protests could bring down the unity that was created after the final act of the Great Spirit. The two talked a lot during the return trip. They were great friends, besides that, skilled warriors. In the past they promised that after Teridax, no other great catastrophe should have happened and therefore a line with the Order would have been the only way to get out of that truce altogether once and for all. Eckhart, however, remained doubtful as he took it as a gesture of submission, despite peace was actually his greatest desire. Too many conflicting thoughts invaded the head of the Glatorian, until at a certain point he was interrupted by Kina, who greeted him by taking the road leading to Tejun. Once arrived at the gates of Volcanus, he was stopped by an Agori named Rubix, who urged him to come down immediately from his sand stalker and follow her. The little Agori took him to the suburbs, near her dwelling, but before letting him in, she confessed a secret she had promised not to tell anyone. Some time ago, back from Tejun, she found a wounded Toa. His name was Kapura and he belonged to the village of Ahinui. She felt remorse but decided then to rescue him and brought to her home, when she provided him with adequate care. Whenever she would go outside her home, Capra had to hide in the cellar to avoid being seen or heard from the other Agori. If anyone had found out, the little Agori would have been executed as established by the law of that period. However, a few minutes before Eckhart's return, she found the body of Capra lifeless. Now Eka was faced with an even more enigmatic dilemma. Who or what was responsible for this? Were the Agori guilty? And so Herrix could wait. Now the priority was the truth about Capua. Before starting the research, Eka asked Rubisk for information to understand where to start. The Agori told him that she saw lately many very ambiguously dressed individuals near her home. 
Thinking about whether they were mercenaries or foreigners from other villages, she decided to disregard them. Ekar asked how they were dressed and she replied that the color of their armor was not possible to see as they wore cloaks. She thought they were to cover themselves from the eventual sandstorms of the desert. Their stature? asked Ekar. Rubix replied that they were slightly taller than an Agori, but smaller than a Gratorian. They may have been Matoran, but the option was immediately discarded as Ranu, under the consent of the other leaders, doubled the guard to ensure that no Matoran would sit inside the villages. Rubix recognized only the face of one of them, but it looked deformed. Eckhart then decided to inform only Kina about this. No one else said no, not even Grash, though Eckhart and Kina trusted him a lot. One misstep and the truth between the two world powers could have broken. So the two warriors left for each village, paying attention to any presence of the strange individuals described by Rubix. The next day, they departed from Volcanus and Tajun, and then reached Zara. At the entrance of the training rooms, they found Grash, excited to see his mentors again. At that time, he was experiencing great moments of glory in the arena. He became the best fighter after Bastus in Tazara. His goal was to reach the skills and experience of Akar, for whom he had great admiration. The Glatorian of Volcanus, in turn, saw him as the next commander of the army of Sir Tavis. In fact, he had the possibility of choosing his successor in case of death or resignation. For Grash, it would have been a real honor to finally be able to prove his worth to the United Villages and to the teachings of the Great Spirit. But Eckhart didn't give it much thought, at least for the time being. For him, it was essential to find a breakthrough in his research to re-establish the peace. So, has the pact with the Order been sealed? Is the end of the war near? Grash asked, but Eckhart did not answer. The two decided to take advantage of the situation to ask him if he had seen some strangers coming to the village. I don't think so. The guards would have spotted them. Eckhart and Kina didn't have the time to respond with a new series of questions. Glatorian of Volcano St. June, please, reach the four leaders with us. They were soldiers sent by the village leaders to Oftazara to have a private meeting with Ekar and Kina. The situation became more complicated when, once they reached the four heads of Tazara, the they were asked of the reason of their presence. Kina replied that it was for a simple visit to their young apprentice. Have you heard about the disappearance of Samagorian Matora in the region of Ice? asked one of the leaders. Both warriors shuddered. Now even the Gordon disappeared? The culprit, therefore, could not belong to either side, and so the options were two. The remaining Bone Hunters and Skrull, or the Hero Factory itself. Eckhart didn't know how to answer to get there from finding out about the research. A huge boom caused an earthquake of high magnitude that spread all over the planet. Strangely, however, it lasted for a few seconds and then permanently ceased. In the hero checkpoints, the protodermis radars reached the highest levels and the energy spread to any being of the planet. Any organism, from the individual Toa and Glatorian to every Rahi, was radiated by this wave of energy. No one was able to explain. Nuju and Vakama were heading north, theoretically towards Volcanus. In the last days, Vakama had continually the same vision, not understanding the reason for all this and above all how to react. Nuju, on the other hand, was always ready to help his brother. It was as if all the other Toa had a weakness for Vakama, not only because he was their leader, but also because his visions almost always manifested for real. For the moment, they interpreted the last images as an important warning, and therefore, it was necessary to be cautious. Even the strange coincidences in which Vakama and his brothers found themselves were weird. Thousands of years ago, in fact, they were chosen as new protectors of Metro Nui to extinguish a great threat like Pterodax. Now there was probably a similar one, 
or even worse, as if they had leaped back in time. But obviously, it was impossible. The landscapes change a lot too, including the cities, their structure, and of course, the war-torn areas. But between rich factions, how many years had passed for all these changes? Somewhere else, in the ice desert, Mata was found by a group of Matoran soldiers, probably from Tio Nui. Who are you? asked the four men. Mata introduced himself and said not to fear, as the other Turaga and he were returned with the task of protecting them and the other Matoran. That's weird, said one of them. There should already be a group of Toa protecting us. I suppose they managed to find a replacement to the six Toa. But why did they add six and not one? Another Matoran supposed. Matao felt strange and therefore asked for explanations. The Matoran answered that a few years ago, Toa Herricks summoned five Matoran from the ancient Matronui, and thanks to the power of the Red Star, they became Toa. And the sixth Matoran? Matao asked. We don't know what happened to him. We don't even know what his name is. This intrigued Matao, who then decided to ask for help and more explanations to the Turaga or the leader of their village, and of course, to convince him or her to send soldiers to find Nokama. And that makes a hundred and two, brother. So many dead for a small village in the desert. When Nua and Onewa were more and more shocked by the hundreds of Matoran heroes found dead in the rubble of some cities. It seemed to be a nightmare. In addition to this, they found the corpse of some old friends from the times when they were Matoran. In those days, Metronui lived a period of peace and prosperity. Then, as Tuyet was corrupted by the power of the Nui Stone, darkness fell upon the city. Onewa had so many groups of friends with whom he spent his free time. Wenua, on the other hand, was a bit narrower and a workaholic. It was as if Onewa had eradicated the sense of loneliness that drove Wenua to stay alone. The two warriors continued their journey through the desert, when in the distance they saw a figure watching them. What do you think is doing, Onewa? I don't know, but stay ready for anything, brother. As time passed, the figure vanished completely, perhaps as a result of the strong heat, until at some point, a voice behind them said, You too! Who are you? The Toa turned and saw a small individual riding a sand stalker, but he couldn't quite tell well who he was because of the sunlight. His white armor shone strongly, together with his silver kanohi. It was the famous vol attack once belonged to Tony Diki and Tony Paru, who else owned it by the spy of the Order Mazeka. Part 2 The Fall of a Hero Ferno was constantly training at the command tower in Makuhiro City, where holograms were often projected to make the training more realistic. In the recent years, Mokuro wanted to introduce the biomechanical holograms to test the results collected by scientists and to understand what modifications could be made to the ultimate armor. Indeed, the Toa and Glatorian boasted greater physical strength and ability than the heroes, and for this reason the new armor had to be resistant at any temperature, suitable for any environment, and above all, able to mitigate the damage caused by the opponents. Many gadgets were equipped to ensure that the hero could survive in any dangerous situation. The recent attacks forced scientists to speed up the task without getting any results. Makuro then decided to intervene, and so, after hundreds of years, he returned to work out new plans, new projects, and resumed secret studies he conducted on Protodermis. Breeze and Serge were also training with their team leader. They became his most faithful companions, and on whom he could certainly count. With Rocca, however, the situation was different. Still, after a long time, they competed for the place of second half leader. Neither had impressed Stormer too much yet. Each expedition was for them a very important opportunity to prevail over the other. Their rivalry was so heated that during a mission they fought before being operational. Stormer would have chosen the true leader who fears nothing, has charisma, 
and who'd have defended the hero factory of all costs. Now, Planet 1210 was the perfect occasion for them. Both knew very well that this planet was considered by Makuro as the most interesting on which to establish their roots and, uh, in case of war, they could have proven their worth. At one point, the training of the three heroes was interrupted by a private, who invited Ferno and the other two to follow him in the mission room. Unfortunately for them, Zib, the mission manager, told them that Nax had passed away. Some strange creature attacked Alpha Leader in the jungle of Tazara during a mission of Planet 2210, he explained to the young soldiers, and during the fight Nax was badly wounded. I'm sorry guys, he didn't make it. Furno could not believe his words. For him, Nax, along with Serge, was like a close friend. It was time to get this over with. Enough with the attacks. Enough with these deaths. Now they had to raise their head, reinforce themselves, and counterattack whoever was responsible. About that, Zib said, they are looking for new volunteers to test the ultimate armor. It seems that Makura joined the construction team, giving a big help and... We'll go now, the hero with the red armor replied. In the assembly tower, Ferno met Fortis, head of the recon team, where there was also Raka. Ferno asked him why they were there too. Confidential, Merrick replied dryly. Ferno indeed did not know that also Fortis' team was headed for planet War 210. The departure was near, and Ferno took advantage of the situation to make a speech to all heroes to inform them about the next death. An hour later, he left together with a convoy of 60 selected soldiers. Fortis and his men were part of the squadron, but before arriving, they changed course and landed on dry land near Roxtus. We're landing in two minutes. You know what to do, Fortis told his teammates. The arrival near the desert of Roxus was near. And so, the Hero Factory decided to launch its counterattack against those who took the life of its scientists and comrades for no apparent reason. Avenging Nevo, avenging Nax, avenging the dozens of people who atrociously lost their lives because of despicable and cowardly beings. Fortis' duties were clear and, given the high risk, he was assigned another task force to command from distance. Their goal was only one, to find the enemy and kill it. The recon team was also one of the few teams that in many cases had the permission to kill the hostiles, probably for their dangerousness. They went down to a checkpoint in the creek canyon where they waited for the night. Meanwhile, Fortis worked out an attack plan with Fox, his second in command. The two teams would have taken two different paths, so that they could bypass the enemy and attack it. We're moving northeast. He pointed to the map as he spoke to the head of the second team. Nigel, you and your men will be heading northwest. Our services have spotted the enemy at position 230. You will stand at position 211 in the middle of the mountains and wait for my signal to start the offensive. Is that clear? Affirmative, Merrick. A few hours earlier, Ferno and the convoy arrived at the HQ on the Skrull River where they supplied the base with the materials for the manufacture of the ultimate armor. Soon anyone could have taken advantage of the services and upgrades that the new and probably latest upgrade was able to provide. The meeting with the team leaders of all checkpoints was scheduled off for the afternoon at the mission center. The three heroes were greeted by Stormer, with whom they would have had a private conversation in room A01. The atmosphere, however, was different for what they expected. Sadness emerged among the locals, but above all, a lot of fear. The number of guards was increased and soldiers often stopped the residents to ask them for identity documents to prevent strangers from infiltrating. And finally, many tourists were placed in each corner of the HQ. I know, it's not a pretty sight. This is work, kids, said Stormer and Bittered. Later they privately discussed 
and search X Alpha Leader where Rocca and the Recon team were headed. In advance, they have the task of finding the enemy's location and to attack. Um, what if there were, um, complications? Serge asked, embarrassed. Then we'll be ready to fight back, boy. Later, in the mission center, there was the meeting between the team leaders in which Stormer and the three young gears took part. They discussed at length how to deal with this phantom threat. Many proposed new ideas on how to redistribute checkpoints to safer locations. Others reported that even the biomechanics got attacked by these strangers and that in their case the situation was worsening due to the ongoing war. Maybe an alliance would be the best hypothesis. Sure, but at the moment we have to think about how to counterattack these beings. I believe that we must declare war on both sides to take this planet once and for all. Thousands of opinions began to surface, and in a short time, different ideas and thoughts were generated, contrasting with each other. At one point, a green figure suddenly materialized on one of the conductor tubes placed at a certain height. Stormer quickly realized that it was the same one that attacked him and his team in Tazara shortly before Nek's death. <laughs>